And now when it hits the chair, <coughs> Burke. Good morning. Welcome to the June 2014, June. I read well, but the calendar is bad. Let's try this again. Good morning and welcome to the September, by an inch, 2014 meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, would you like to review the calendar and tell us what's on today, please? Thank tell you, us Mr. what day Chairman. it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, commissioners. Today you will hear five items for your consideration. First, you would consider a report and order that would eliminate the Commission's sports blackout rules, which can prevent consumers from watching their team's games on local television. Second, you will consider a further notice of proposed rulemaking to streamline and update Part 25 of the Commission's rules, which governs licensing and operation of space stations and Earth stations for the provision of satellite communication services. These proposals will amend, clarify, or elim eliminate numerous rule provisions and reduce regulatory burdens. Third, you will consider a declaratory ruling that clarifies that the Commission intends to make all reasonable efforts to preserve both the coverage area and population served of eligible broadcast television stations and the repacking process associated with the incentive auction. Fourth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking to revise rules for unlicensed operations in the TV bands and new 600 megahertz band, including fixed and personal portable white space devices and unlicensed microphones. The proposed changes and new rules are intended to allow more robust and spectrally efficient unlicensed operations without increasing the risk of, un of harmful interference to other users. Fifth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking to address the needs of wireless microphone users while recognizing that they must share spectrum with other wireless uses in an increasingly crowded spectral environment. This is your agenda for today. The first item will be presented by the Media Bureau. Bill Lake, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Lake. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Today, the Media Bureau presents a report and order that eliminates our sports blackout rules. The Commission initially adopted sports blackout rules in 1975 to help ensure the overall availability of sports programming to television viewers. The sports industry has changed significantly since that time. The Commission began this proceeding to determine whether the sports blackout rules are still needed in light of these changes. The item before you continues the agency's regulatory reform efforts by eliminating rules that are outdated and unnecessary in today's marketplace. Joining me at the table today are Nancy Murphy of the Media Bureau front office and Mary Beth Murphy, Stephen Brockhart, and Kathy Berthot of the Bureau's policy division. Kathy will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present this report in order eliminating the Commission's sports blackout rules. Almost 40 years ago, the Commission adopted rules prohibiting cable operators from retransmitting within a protected local blackout zone the signal of a distant broadcast station carrying a sports event if the event is blacked out in a local television broadcast station. These rules were intended to ensure that the potential loss in ticket sales resulting from cable operators' importation of distant stations would not lead sports leagues to refuse to sell their rights to sports events to the distant stations, which would reduce the amount of sports programming available to television viewers. The Commission later applied these rules to open video systems and then to satellite carriers. The report in order finds that the sports industry has evolved dramatically since the sports blackout rules were first adopted. The sports blackout rules are no longer relevant for sports other than NFL football. With respect to NFL football, the massive popularity of the sport has led to substantial growth in both television revenues and overall revenues for the NFL. Ticket sales were the primary source of revenue for the NFL when the sports blackout rules were adopted in 1975. Television revenues are now the NFL's main source of revenue and are expected to reach around $6 billion this year. Total NFL revenues are reportedly exceeded $10 billion in 2013. The popularity of NFL football has also resulted in a substantial decline in local blackouts of NFL games. 
In 1975, almost 60% of NFL games were blacked out because they failed to sell out. Last year, only two out of 256 regular season NFL games, fewer than 1%, were blacked out. And no games have been blacked out yet this year. Moreover, in recent years, blackouts have affected only a few NFL markets, such as Buffalo, Cincinnati, and San Diego. In addition, the report and order finds that elimination of the sports blackout rules is unlikely to reduce the availability of NFL games to consumers who rely on free over-the-air television by leading the NFL to migrate its games from broadcast television to pay TV. The NFL's existing contracts with the broadcast networks extend through 2022. Further, it is highly doubtful that it would be more profitable for the NFL to distribute its games via pay TV than via broadcast television in the absence of the sports blackout rules. Based on all of these factors, the report and order concludes that the economic considerations that prompted adoption of the sports blackout rules are no longer valid and therefore the sports blackout rules are no longer needed to ensure that sports events are widely available to television viewers. The report and order accordingly concludes that the sports blackout rules are outdated and should be eliminated. Elimination of these rules also will remove regulatory support for the NFL's own blackout policy, which prevents some consumers from watching their team's games on television even though they have subsidized those teams with their tax dollars through publicly funded stadiums and other tax benefits. Finally, the report and order acknowledges that elimination of the sports blackout rules may not end all sports blackouts. The NFL has stated that it likely will continue its private blackout policy. From now on, to the extent that it does choose to continue that policy, it must do so without the protections provided by the sports blackout rules. Instead, it must rely on the same avenues available to other entities that wish to protect their distribution rights in the private marketplace. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the report in order and request editorial privileges. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Few issues can unite or divide a city as professional sports, and few sports have the power to evoke deeply held emotions as American football. At the risk of some heresy, I must say that football has long eclipsed baseball as America's national pastime. My grandfather would be disappointed. But even here in D.C., as the amazing Washington Nationals have clinched their division, earned the best record in baseball, and ended the season with a historic no-hitter a few days ago, that remains a fact. This is true even considering the fate of Washington's football team, which is saddled with injuries, wrestling with quarterback challenges, and resisting calls to change the team's names for being offensive to Native Americans, and a league criticized heavily for its repeated fumbles by way of sensitivity when it comes to spouses and girlfriends, and lately for not incorporating the principles of the Rooney Rule when it comes to hiring advisors to address those headline-grabbing issues that have occurred off the field. Every year, for the 17-week period from Labor Day through Christmas Day, 32 teams in the National Football League strapped up to do battle on the field and interrupt some of my favorite television viewing, but that's okay. <laughs> week in and week out, Americans from every walk of life gather in living rooms, restaurants, sports bars, and venues large and small to cheer on their favorite team and players, from Mo Romo to RG3, from Megatron to Manning, from Rogers to Richard Sherman, from J.J. Watt to Russell Wilson. Make no mistake about it, football is our national pastime. We rearrange our personal lives, those weekday errands, Sunday worship schedule, sorry, Pastor, in order to catch those weekly NFL games, a schedule that now extends both Monday to Monday and Thursday nights as well. The reward of regular season success, a ticket to the Super Bowl, and the chance to raise a coveted Lombardi Trophy, the pinnacle of football achievement. Super Bowl weekend has become an unofficial American holiday. In fact, the Super Bowl has become so enshrined in and essential to our economy that major corporations build their annual advertising budgets around the commercials, paying hundreds of millions of dollars 
for 30 to 60 second spots. Of course, those commercials have a life and a culture of their own, but that is another story. And many of the world's top entertainments peg their career high points or low points to halftime performances. Some performances have even become FCC folklore, <laughs> one in particular for sure. <laughs> Professional football has grown so much in popularity that venues have become pantheons not only to the sport, but to those corporate brands seeking the rewards of official sponsorship and team affinity. With the bright lights, jumbotrons, and decibel bending crowd noise, there is nothing like being in a stadium, and yes, I can attest to that. And to that, an extended array of food, which I love, entertainment, which is cool, and retail choices, attending an NFL game is quite an experience. Although ticket prices are quite high, most NFL games still sell out, and for those fans, it's an expense that is well worth the price. But let's be clear here this morning. The vast majority of fans cannot afford to even park at a football game, let alone attend these extravaganzas. What is also abundantly clear is that the sports industry has changed significantly since the sports blackout rules were first adopted by the FCC in 1975. In fact, our record finds today that these rules are no longer relevant for any sport other than professional football, which has seen a decline in the number of NFL games blacked out due to failure to sell out. Television revenues have replaced Gates receipts as a primary source of revenue for NFL teams, and the FCC today feels there is scant chance that teams will choose to move their games to pay TV if the sports blackout rules are abolished as some charge. So rightly before us this morning is an item that eliminates the sports blackout rules for cable operators, satellite carriers, and open video systems and concludes that the commission has the authority to do so. When I originally circulated this item in November of 2013, I believe that the time had come to review FCC, the FCC regulatory involvement and what is essentially a private set of relationships between the NFL broadcasters and cable operators. What I especially appreciate about this item before us today is that it furthers the public interest in two key ways. First, by removing unnecessary and outdated regulations, and second, by abandoning regulatory enforcement of the NFL's private blackout policy. While nothing we do can guarantee fans that there will never be another blackout, it takes a public policy finger off the scale of being a party to any future blackout. The resolution of such will be left to the parties through their private contractual arrangements, not the Federal Communications Commission. In sum, the goal of these rules was never to protect the profitability of sports leagues, but to ensure that America's favorite pastime was widely available to television viewers. Because we do not see that the current rules will ensure that this will occur, I applaud the chairman for a sustained drive to take the ball over the goal line by abolishing rule, a rule whose time has expired. I wish to thank uh, Bill Lake, Kathy, Mary Beth, Stephen, and Nancy for their great work on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank I just you. want you to note that I'm not trying to, um, uh, I've got this kind of bass voice today. I'm not trying to prove a point. Um, I just had a tremendous weekend. Thank you. <laughs> You can't just let that hang. <laughs> I believe it's in my best interest to do so. <laughs> Commissioner Rosenworcel. My weekend wasn't that interesting. <laughs> All right. The commission's sports blackout rules were adopted the same year the Baltimore Colts, the St. Louis Cardinals, and the Los Angeles Rams clinched their respective NFL division titles. These teams are no longer with us. We bid adieu to them years ago. It is time also to say goodbye to this agency's archaic sports blackout policies. 
Our rules were put in place to help ensure that stadiums were filled with fans. This prevented cable operators and satellite carriers from carrying a game in a market where it was not otherwise available on a local broadcast channel. By protecting the gate receipts of professional teams, the primary source of revenue at the time, the sports blackout rules helped support a community institution. But revenues today for professional sports teams are a multi-billion dollar mix of television rights, stadium naming rights, merchandise, licensing, corporate sponsorship, and luxury suites. For the life of me, I do not understand why this commission still has rules in the middle of this mix. They are a vestige from a bygone era. It is time for us to retire them. So I'm pleased we do that today. I think this is good for sports fans. This agency should not support policies that prevent fans from watching their hometown teams on television. To be clear, even as we remove our rules, we cannot guarantee an end to sports blackouts. That is because blackouts can still be enforced by privately negotiated contracts. But I would hope that leagues that rely on this rule, namely the NFL, find a solution to avoid blackouts. If not, I think they will risk alienating existing fans and turning off would-be fans at a time when they cannot afford to do so. So I want to commend my colleague, then Chairwoman Clyburn, for initiating this proceeding, and Chairman Wheeler for, and here's the inevitable sports pun, <laughs> carrying the ball across the line. This has my full support. Dennis Steinmiller of North Tonawanda, New York, has been a Buffalo Bills fan for as long as he can remember. But as a disabled Vietnam veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder and limited mobility, he's unable uh, to attend the team's games at Ralph Wilson Stadium. These days, watching the Bills on television is one of the things that Mr. Steinmiller looks forward to every year. He also says that it helps him deal with his PTSD. Unfortunately for him and other uh, Buffalo fans, nine Bills games have been blacked out in Western New York over the last four seasons. Mr. Steinmiller is one of the thousands of sports fans who have written to the commission asking us to, uh, to eliminate our 40-year-old, hopelessly outdated sports blackout rule. And ever since I announced my support for eliminating this rule at Buffalo's Anchor Bar, the birthplace of Buffalo Wings, and the home to some pretty good beer. That was all work-related, by the way. Uh, I've heard words of encouragement from hundreds of people just like him. And this morning, with our upcoming vote, we show him and all the sports fans across the country that we are listening. Now, as someone who believes in limited government, my position on this issue is pretty simple. The FCC shouldn't be involved in the sports blackout business. It is not the place of the federal government to intervene in the private marketplace and help sports leagues enforce their blackout policies. It's the commission's job to serve the public interest, not the private interests of team owners. Make no mistake about it. With this decision, the FCC is officially out of the sports blackout business. No longer will we be on the side of those willing to keep fans in the dark. Instead, we will stand with Dennis Steinmiller and the millions of other fans who love their teams but aren't able to make it to the stadium due to the cost of tickets, age, disability, family obligations, or one of any, any other reasons. Now, to be sure, our vote today may not end all blackouts. We are eliminating our blackout rule, but professional sports leagues like the NFL can still choose to maintain their own blackout policies. But if the NFL in particular chooses that path, it will do so without the FCC's endorsement and will have to enforce its policy without our help. Now that begs the question of what happens next. For my part, I hope that the NFL will not respond to today's vote by digging in its heels. Instead, it should view this decision as an opportunity to revisit the blackout policy um, and to view it as an opportunity to connect with fans like Mr. Steinmiller 
and to adopt a more fan-friendly approach. In the weeks leading up to today's vote, some have tried to scare sports fans by arguing that football games in particular will move from broadcast television to cable or satellite TV if the FCC eliminates the sports blackout rule. Let me address that argument head on. To begin with, there's no way that this can happen anytime soon. For example, the NFL's contracts with over-the-air broadcasters extends until 2022. But more importantly, by moving games to pay TV, the NFL would be cutting off its nose to spite its face. As has been pointed out, television contracts, not gate receipts, make up a substantial majority of the NFL's revenue nowadays. And professional football is by far America's most popular sport, in part, I would argue, because it is the only major sport that makes most of its games available on free, over-the-air television. This year, for example, the NFL started airing its Thursday night football games on CBS, as well as the NFL Network. And what are the results? For CBS's first broadcast, the audience was up 89% over last year. In the second week, the audience was up 7% over the prior year. Now, that 7% figure is actually quite remarkable when you consider that the game was a blowout with the Atlanta Falcons leading the Tampa Bay Buccaneers 35-0 to zero at halftime and going on to win 56-14. to 14. I would note, on a, as a matter of personal privilege, that a certain fantasy football owner of Matt Ryan and Julio Jones watched the entire game. And it was quite glorious. And in the third week, last Thursday, the audience was up an astounding 96% over last year. Now, the meaning of all these numbers is clear. It will continue to be in the NFL's interest to air games on broadcast television after today's decision, including riveting games like the magnificent destruction of the New England Patriots last night by America's team, the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> Finally, I would like to recognize some valuable players whose efforts led to today's vote. And I'd like to start by thanking Congressman Brian Higgins of New York for his leadership on this issue. It was an honor to stand beside him and other folks in Buffalo as he called on the FCC to eliminate the sports blackout rule. I'd also like to thank Senators John McCain and Richard Blumenthal for their efforts on the Senate side of, uh, of the Congress, as well as uh, the Sports Fan Coalition, represented here today by Brad Blakeman and David Goodfriend, the Consumers, National Consumers League, and public knowledge for filing the petition for rulemaking that launched this proceeding and brought us to this point. And last but not least, my thanks to Chairman Wheeler for bringing this matter to a vote and for the staff of the Media Bureau for their terrific work writing this uh, fantastic item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of all Buffalo fans, we thank Commissioner Pai for visiting. We also thank him for his successful uh, win last night by the Kansas City Chiefs because every loss by New England Patriots is a help to my team, so much appreciated. Let me start by acknowledging that I am a huge fan of American football, the National Football League, in particular the Buffalo Bills. Growing up out just outside of Buffalo, I learned many life lessons by watching my team struggle and succeed over the years. The Bills have always played a significant role in the lives of the people of Western New York and their fans nationwide. Walk into any bar in the area, and there's little doubt that the patrons can name every starting player on the team, and probably the backups, too. To live in Buffalo also means that you face months upon months of cold and nasty weather. In exchange, you are surrounded by good-natured, hard-working, underappreciated, American-loving, family-oriented people. And a major component of most weekends in the fall and the winter for many families is the Bills game. The people love their team. That is why it was so important that the new owner agree to keep the team in Buffalo for the long term. No thanks, Mr. Bon Jovi. As a fan, I've experienced the near highest of highs and the lowest of low moments for my team. I still wonder, what if a wandering kick did not go wide right in the Super Bowl years ago? A fan's highs and lows with their team can be overcome, but what was downright infuriating growing up was the weekly concern that the NFL's blackout policy, bolstered by FCC rules, would force us to radio instead of watching the Bills on television. When many fans don't have the means or the opportunity to attend a game, one of the only hopes is that the local businesses would purchase tickets, like my former employee, the local grocery store, did on multiple occasions. 
To put this in perspective, let me share with you one of the greatest NFL games ever that almost no one in Buffalo saw. Known simply in NFL parlance as the comeback, the Bills spotted the then Houston Oilers to a lead of 35-3 in the 1992-93 AFL- AFC wildcard game. I will spare you the stories of a backup quarter back uh, historic removal uh, and return that turned the game around. But the Bills won that game in overtime 41-38 and propelled the team to their third straight Super Bowl appearance and loss. Forgotten in the discussion is the simple fact that the game was blacked out in western New York. I happened to see parts of the game from my part-time job in a local restaurant under a satellite to retransmission exemption, but my family and friends did not see the game live. As I have previously discussed publicly, this issue is not all that difficult for me to consider. Today's item does a good job explaining the arguments presented to maintain the rules and then adequately shoots them down one by one with fairly strong responses. To me, the only issues that really matter is whether the FCC's rules are providing unnecessary protections to the NFL and does that harm consumers. Upon review, the answer to these questions is yes, and therefore I'm pleased to approve this item. I do not agree with the supposition that absent the FCC's sports blackout rules, the NFL would be unable to enforce its copyrights for NFL games. To the contrary, the NFL is in prime position with sufficient, sufficient leverage to convince broadcasters and MVPDs to agree to certain contractual provisions, including adhering to its misguided blackout policy, or risk losing access to the highest rated programming on television. Simply put, the NFL does not need the FCC rules to do what it can do for itself. In terms of impact on American consumers, the FCC's rules promote a policy that limits access to NFL games. Just last year, Buffalo Bills and San Diego Charger fans experienced blackouts. Moreover, three NFL playoff games, the Colts, the Packers, and Bengals, faced blackouts until being saved by last-minute ticket purchases. To argue that the number of blackouts is decreasing under the NFL's newly constructed policy is irrelevant. The policy serves to punish entire communities for the fact that the collective citizens in those areas are unable or unwilling for legitimate reasons to sell out the game that week. It is not the role of the commission to ensure that the NFL gets every last nickel out of each NFL game being played. I also disagree with the arguments that the elimination of the FCC's sports blackout rules would somehow drive NFL games away from free over-the-air television and towards pay television. The NFL maintains games on ad-sponsored broadcast television because at this time, it is in the NFL's best financial interest. Football games on over-the-air broadcast stations still receive higher ratings and ad revenues than those on pay television. Ultimately, however, Whether the majority of football games remain on broadcast television as opposed to cable networks will be a decision made by the NFL on how best to distribute its programming as opposed to whether or not there is a blackout rule or maybe whether the number of fans reached. Case in point is the 2005 decision to move its Monday night game from ABC, which had carried the game for previous 35 years, to ESPN despite the existence of the blackout rule and the undisputed fact that more Americans have access to ABC than ESPN. Similarly, the choice was made to broadcast only half of the Thursday night games this year on CBS, which is far fewer viewers than the NFL Network, which has the rights to the other games. As has been said, we should acknowledge what our actions here will do and not do. The Commission has the ability to repeal the FCC's rules enforcing the NFL's blackout policy, but that will do nothing to change the ability of the NFL to impose and enforce its own existing policy on broadcasters or MVPDs. The NFL has the right to maintain its current blackout policy, and I suspect that they will do so. That means consumers in small sports markets should continue to expect the threat of future blackouts. Today's item just means that the FCC will no longer be complicit in helping to continue such a flawed policy. I thank the chairman and the media bureau staff for preparing the item before us and moving it expeditiously. The commission should look for more opportunities to remove or repeal rules that can be addressed by legal remedies or other methods available to the private sector. I thank the chairman. Thank you, commissioner. Uh, And thank you, Bill and Kathy and Mary Beth, 
Stephen and Nancy and all the members of the Media Bureau for bringing this home. I think you've seen that football viewing is a very personal experience to uh, five people sitting up here. And Commissioner Clyburn, Chairwoman Clyburn, um, it was you that dusted off the 40 years of mold that had gathered over this rule and set it on the course that we finally close today. So thank you for your leadership you. for getting this going. It's a simple fact. The federal government should not be party to sports teams keeping their fans from viewing the games, period. But let's be clear about one simple point, and that is it is the leagues that control whether sports fans can watch the games they want to watch. If there are blackouts next weekend, or Monday night, or Thursday night, let alone on Sunday, it will be the decision of the league and its team owners not with the, without the participation of the federal government. For 40 years, these teams have hidden behind a rule of the FCC. No more. Everyone needs to be aware who allows blackouts to exist, and it is not the Federal Communications Commission. This is an opportunity. I hope the NFL will seize on this opportunity to repudiate blackouts just like we're about to repudiate the blackout rule here. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. The ayes have it. Madam Secretary. The second, thank you. the second item will be presented by the International Bureau. It is entitled Comprehensive Review of Licensing and Operating Rules for Satellite Services. Ms. Delatore, over to you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman Good and morning. Commissioners. We go from football to satellites now. <laughs> so I'm honored to be here today to introduce the International Bureau's latest efforts uh, to streamline regulatory requirements and advance the FCC's process reform proposals. A little over a year ago, the Commission adopted the most comprehensive review in more than 20 years of Part 25 of the Commission's rules that govern the licensing and um, operation of satellite space and earth stations. Now that wholesale review, undertaken with, under the leadership and diligence of Rod Porter, Bob Nelson, Cassandra Thomas, and Fern Jamalnik, resulted in the Commission's adoption of a report and order that streamlined, modified, or retired some 150 provisions of our rules. Now I'm not sure if that exercise was the cause, but since then, Rod Porter and Fern Jamalnik have retired, and now Cassandra Thomas is retiring at the end of, this, of October. So if you'd please indulge me for just one second, I'd like to specifically rec uh, recognize Cassandra, who's stand sitting over there. She will be tremendously uh, missed, as her satellite experience has spanned over 30 years here at the Commission. <laughs> She didn't really want to sit at the table today, but I made her at least come to the meeting. Um, in last year's report and order, we noted that the work was not done and that the International Bureau was committed to further streamline numerous Part 25 uh, rules that were left on the books. The Bureau's review then continued under the guidance of the new Satellite Division Chief, Jose Albuquerque, and then under the leadership of Diane Cornell, another satellite expert, the FCC process reform efforts began, which provided the Bureau an opportunity to expand the scope and the vision of streamlining the Part 25 rules. We also received valuable input from the satellite industry as we developed these proposals. 
In this item before you, we explore alternatives to some decades-old licensing policies. We propose changes that will expedite both the Earth and the space station licensing and ease administrative burdens on applicants, licensees, and commission staff. The item proposes changes that will allow operators as much operational flexibility as possible, consistent with minimizing harmful interference in other services and making sure that orbital locations and associated spectrum are being efficiently utilized. As you are aware, the satellite industry continues to grow and innovate. According to a 2014 Satellite Industry Association report, global satellite revenues for 2013 totaled almost $200 billion and revenues have nearly tripled since 2004. Going forward, the Bureau is dedicated to continuing um, to examine the Part 25 rules and propose recommendations to amend and streamline rules to better reflect technological um, progress so that the U.S. satellite industry can continue to launch new and innovative space-based technologies. So with me at the table today are Rod, uh, uh, Troy Tanner, who t took the place of, uh, you know, he sort of walked in in the middle of last year into Rod Porter's big shoes, uh, Deputy uh, Bureau Chief. Jose Albuquerque, who is the chief of the satellite division, and with him, he brings years of experience in the industry itself, and I think that was extremely important to this exercise. And the two principal authors of the item, we have Bill Bell, an attorney in the satellite policy branch, and then Chip Fleming, who is the chief engineer of the satellite division. And I'd like to uh, thank a few others, Steve Spaeth, Jennifer Gelson, and uh, Diane Garfield, Cal Karmar, Cindy Spears, Carl Kinzinger, Jerry Duvall, and Walt Strack for their inputs on this item as well. And now Jose is going to present the item. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, this draft for the notice contains a significant number of proposals, but I would like to focus uh, on three sets of proposals that implement recommendations from the process uh, uh, reform report. The first set would introduce more flexibility by allowing applicants to file for orbital locations and frequency with the International Telecommunications Union at an early stage of a satellite project. An earlier ITU filing would place these uh, applicants in a better position to coordinate with other parties that are competing for the same resource. The rules proposed to implement this early ITU filing option include a requirement to file a detailed description of the proposed satellite within a specific, uh, specified time period. Current licensees are required to post a, a, a surety bond when a license is granted. The further notice poses the questions of whether a bond obligation should also be associated with this early submission of an ITU filing, but also uh, requests comments on possible other alternatives. The issue being that once you have this ITU filing, you are potentially holding resource from others, and therefore the idea of the bond has to be considered. A second set of proposals address the current bond and milestone policy associated with the grant of a satellite license. Currently, in addition to posting a bond, a licensee has to meet several interim milestones. For instance, start uh, signing a contract, firming up the design, uh, starting construction. Uh, and finally, well, launch and uh, start operating the satellite. Meeting these uh, interim milestones uh, successfully reduce the bond amount and compliance showings are required for each of them. The further notice discusses several possibilities of simplifying this process. For instance, a simplified and better defined criteria for demonstrating compliance with milestones a reduction or elimination of interim milestones, making interim milestone showings uh, uh, optional, and also progressively re increasing bond payment liability to encourage uh, 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 early release of spectrum resources that are not going to be used. A third significant set of proposals address possible adjustments to the two-degree spacing policy. I mean, they asked me to specify exactly what this is, and I am doing that. This policy, which was uh, uh, introduced in the 1980s, defined conditions for satellites to be able to operate at the two degree spacing in the orbit, and uh, with that, increased the number of satellites that could be launched within the geostationary arc. Uh, the policy was devised to accommodate, Earth in order to be 
able to operate at two degrees. There are some limitations on the minimum size of first stations that can operate with these satellites. What happens is that since then, the use of smaller earth stations has grown significantly. And uh, we are proposing certain adjustments to the rule to accommodate the use of smaller stations. For instance, customer uh, direct-to-home uh, service uh, earth stations, earth stations on vessels or on aircraft. Uh, other important issues related to the first come, first serve policy are also addressed. Again, the first come, first, poli uh, first serve policy uh, indicates that uh, once we receive an application that it's not compatible with an existing license or a previously submitted application, that application is not going to be considered. Of course, this makes a lot of sense, but it also makes sense to reconsider whether the criteria applied to determine this compatibility or not between different applications are the most, still the most appropriate ones. Well, in addition to these fundamental issues, the further notice proposed many other changes to the Commission's rules for satellite communication systems. And all these changes, as indicated by Mendel, would simplify and streamline information required in license applications and provide more flexibility. I don't think I need to go into too much detail, but uh, we would have an expansion of routine license eligibility would have automatic grant for certain unopposed space station modification applications, would, would eliminate, uh, uh, propose to eliminate requires to receive only our stations that receive from uh, foreign licensed satellites, but which have been authorized to provide service to U.S. We eliminate, propose to eliminate several requirements for conventional C-band space stations. We eliminate cross-polarization requirements for space stations, which, among other advantages, reduce significantly the detailed information that is required in the applications. And uh, we also propose a relaxation of deadlines for submitting predict and measure antenna gain data for 1724 gigahertz space stations. Uh, the Bureau recommends adoption of these items and requests editorial privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Commissioner Clyburn. Thank you. Satellite technology provides much needed communication service throughout the world, and is particularly important in remote and unserved communities. It can also provide first responders with ubiquitous, reliable coverage during emergencies and natural disasters. For these reasons, the Commission seeks to revise regulations that have become outdated and impose unnecessary administrative costs on companies in order to spur greater innovation and investment. With this further notice, the International Bureau continues to recommend wise proposals to update the Part 25 rules that govern satellite operations. At the top of the list is giving satellite companies the options to start the option to start the registration process with the International Telecommunications Union before submitting a space station application to the FCC. ITU recognition is a must for a successful satellite network operation, and under our current rules, the International Bureau may not begin the ITU registration process for a satellite company until that entity submits to the Commission a detailed application for the frequency band and orbital location of its proposed space station. This application requires technical data that would not be known until, this, until significant pros, progress has been made in the design of a proposed satellite. In addition, it appears that the U.S. is the only administration that imposes such a restriction on ITU filings placing our satellite companies at a competitive disadvantage. Even more harmful is that this enables competitors to monitor the commi commission space station applications and submit a new filing or modify an existing one at the ITU before the U.S. has submitted anything. 
Such claim jumping gives foreign operators the ability to secure ITU priority over their U.S. licensed counterparts. The proposal in the further notice would aptly address this concern while also safeguarding the process against warehousing, whereby a company secures ITU registration priority rights even though it has no serious intent to build satellite services. There are a number of other proposals that will promote the goals of efficiency and modernization. Revising the two-degree spacing policy for GSO FSS satellites will facilitate individualized coordination agreements between satellite companies. Simplifying the current fleet management rule will give providers greater flexibility in implementing satellite relocations. I wish to thank Mr. Albuquerque for his excellent presentation. I really enjoyed hearing you this morning, to be honest with you. I'd like to thank Mr. Bill, Mr. Fleming, and the new uh, Rod, Troy Tanner, uh, for uh, his, um, of all of your work on the item. And of course, I'd like to commend Diane Cornell, and could not forget Mandel Delatore for all of their leadership on this item. And Mandel, we too will miss Cassandra. Godspeed. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner we are on a roll. Last year, the Commission amended over 150 of its Part 25 rule provisions which govern the licensing and operation of space and earth stations providing satellite communications. And today, our streamlining streak continues with a new rulemaking designed to further update our Part 25 rules. To this end, as we just heard, we propose changes to facilitate international coordination refine spacing policies, reduce milestone requirements, and deter spectrum warehousing. These efforts, they're more than ministerial. They matter. Because satellite services provide vital communications links to support routine activities for every one of us every day. Satellite services also provide vital communications links to the most remote regions of the country. They connect our troops around the world and critically, they provide an important backstop for public safety communications when terrestrial networks are down. So I am pleased to support this rulemaking and grateful for the nonstop efforts of the International Bureau staff past and present to update our rules, to reflect new technologies, eliminate outdated requirements, and simplify our licensing procedures. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Fye. The Commission first targeted Part 25 as being in need of reform. The International Bureau set out with the bold objective of re-examining the entire satellite network licensing process. I have no doubt that uh, Jose and Bill and Chip had been listening to that Dave Matthews Band song, Satellite, and took inspiration from the line that everything good needs replacing. Indeed, those lyrics might describe this whole proceeding as we look up, look down, all around to thoroughly review our satellite licensing rules. Last year, for example, we used this proceeding to review and amend 61 separate rules. These include the procedural, such as who may file the Form 312EZ, and they include the technical, such as specifying the maximum equivalent isotropically radiated power, or EIRP, spectral density, for certain stations, a topic on everyone's minds. These, this year, we examined 48 more rules with the able assistance of IB. Now, especially important to me is that uh, today's further notice picks up where we left off last year and tackles some of the challenges that I identified then. Uh, for example, I expressed hope that the further notice would consider Boeing's recommendation to reduce the burden of our milestone review process. And today's item, as described, explores several ways to do just that. I am also grateful, in turn, to my colleagues for incorporating a number of my suggestions into the item. Uh, streamlining the licensing of small earth stations, for example, is just one way that we can mold our rules to make the United States the most desirable country in the world for licensing and operating satellites. Finally, we should be clear that credit for this achievement goes not to those of us sitting at the dais, but to the Commission's dedicated staff. They have earned the laurels by painstakingly scouring the most obscure corners of Part 25. Many of these staffers have been working with these rules since the International Bureau commenced its review. 
And so I extend my gratitude to Jose Albuquerque, Bill Bell, Tim Brennan, Mandel De La Torre, Chip Fleming, Diane Garfield, Jennifer Gilsonen, Carl Kinsinger, Cal Kraut Kramer, Steve Spath, Cindy Spares, Troy Tanner, and Cassandra Thomas. Thanks to all of you for seeing this through, and I look forward to working with you as we complete this proceeding in the coming months. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. I applaud the work of the International Bureau Satellite Division for the preparation of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. On its face, the changes to the Commission's rules governing satellite services may not seem that significant. To the contrary, this is exactly the type of item that can be so helpful to all interested and affected parties. I recognize and acknowledge that a handful of these proposals were generated by Chairman Wheeler's process reform effort from earlier this year. Today's document is dense and chock full of ways to modify and improve our satellite rules from the relatively benign to the overtly helpful. By clarifying our rules, we ensure that companies obligated to comply know exactly what is expected. The modifications proposed can also reduce costs and expand opportunities in the offering of satellite services. The Commission should continue to look for ways to update and improve our rules administered by all bureaus and offices. I look forward to the completion of this item in the near, very near future, and I thank the Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and I join all my colleagues in thanking all of you and Cassandra, hiding over in the corner. Thank you uh, for all of your efforts uh, in this regard. And Diane, to you for your leadership in the overall effort. This has been heavy lifting in the results of streamlining rules and eliminating unnecessary rules and clarifying rules and keeping up with technology are all the kind of results that this agency um, ought to be doing and with your leadership is doing. So thank you to all of you for, uh, for these efforts. And with that, I will call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carried, and the request for editorial privileges is granted. Madam Secretary. The final three items on today's agenda will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology. First, you will hear expanding the economic and innovation opportunities of Spectrum through incentive auctions. Gary, are you driving today? Mr. Epstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Wheeler and Commissioners Clyburn, Rosenworcel, Pye, and O'Reilly. We continue to make steady progress towards implementing the first ever incentive auction. Since the Commission's incentive auction report and order was adopted in May, the staff has completed work on several significant proposals for Commission consideration today three of which are going to be presented this morning. These proposals address critical implementation issues related to the incentive auction and affect multiple stakeholders. The, this morning's items address the operations of important services during and after the incentive auction. Here to tell you more about them is Julie Knapp and his excellent staff in the Office of Engineering and Technology. Thank you, Gary. Um, the first incentive auction item for your consideration is a proposed declaratory ruling. It clarifies how the repacking approach the Commission adopted in the incentive auction report and order meets Congress's mandate to make all reasonable efforts to independently preserve TV station population and coverage areas served. Uh, here with me at the table from OET is uh, Martin Doxert and Aspasia Perusis. ASPA will present the item. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, the draft item before you clarifies the repacking approach the Commission adopted in the May 2014 Incentive Auction Report and Order. It explains how the repacking approach will independently preserve both the coverage area and the population served of eligible broadcasters consistent with Congress's mandate in the Spectrum Act. In repacking the television bands to repurpose Spectrum in the, through the incentive auction, the Spectrum Act requires that the Commission make all reasonable efforts to preserve, as of the date of the enactment of the Act, February 22, 2012, the coverage area and population served of each broadcast television licensee 
as determined using the methodology described in OET Bulletin Number 69. The draft item explains that in the incentive auction report and order, the Commission defined coverage area and population served and established standards for independently protecting each in the repacking process. The equal area approach to be used for preserving coverage area while enabling stations assigned, um, will enable stations assigned to new channels to replicate the areas within their current signal contours as closely as possible using their existing antenna patterns. The same viewer approach to be used for preserving populations served prohibits channel assignments that would cause one station to interfere with 0.5% or more of another station's viewers. The staff recommends adoption and request editorial privileges. Thank you. Mr. Clyburn. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to support this declaratory ruling and I would like to thank ASPA. Thank you for allowing me to call you by your nickname this this morning um, for your presentation and my gratitude to those dedicated staff members to include Julie, Gary, and Martin who've been working long and hard hours on this incentive auction proceeding. Thank you. Mr. Rosenworcel. Thanks. Uh, in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, Congress directed the FCC to conduct groundbreaking voluntary incentive auctions. And this past May, the Commission adopted rules implementing our direction from Congress, and we explained our rationale for those rules, including some details involving the repacking process. You know, I felt that the Commission adequately explained that at the time, but I appreciate that sometimes we want to update our explanations, so I fully support today's decision. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Pai. <coughs> Sorry. Quick, take a quick drink. <laughs> it's a big mug. I have to get through it all. Uh, TV's Columbo, as played by Peter Falk, was a master of the false exit. After interviewing a suspect, he would begin to leave the room, but just before he left uh, the door, he would turn around and ask an astute question uh, that would reveal an inconsistency in the suspect's story. And that question would be prefaced by the famous catchphrase, just one more thing. Well, today, in my view, the commission tries to pull a Columbo. In the incentive auction order, the FCC established rules purporting to implement the congressional directive that we, quote, make all reasonable efforts to preserve the coverage area and population served of each broadcast television licensee as determined using the methodology described in OET Bulletin 69. Now, the National Association of Broadcasters, of course, challenged those rules in court, and that case is now pending in the D.C. Circuit. The time for the commission to reconsider those rules on its own motion has passed. But with this item, the Commission turns back to the parties in the incentive auction proceeding and says, in effect, just one more thing. Perhaps worried about its chances of prevailing in court, the Commission decides at this late date to offer up additional arguments for its already made decision not to protect the unpopulated portions of stations' coverage areas against interference when repacking. Now, whatever the merits of the argument presented in the item, I must respectfully dissent from this highly unusual procedural maneuver. Unlike Colombo, the FCC must comply with the dictates of administrative law. And at this point, the FCC cannot legally change its prior decision other than through notice and comment rulemaking. Once an FCC order has been challenged in court, and once the deadline for its reconsideration has expired, the time for deliberation is over. Instead, the Commission should exit stage right and allow its able <laughs> litigators to defend its position. For once we start down this path, where will it end? Will we issue an order that responds to parties' D.C. Circuit briefs? If oral arguments do not go well for the Commission, will we issue an order to answer the Court's questions and allay its doubts? Courts don't countenance such shenanigans, and the Commission should not try to play such games. Now, four months ago, I warned that we would find ourselves in this exact position, confronted by litigation that might delay the incentive auction, litigation that the Commission might lose. Today's declaratory ruling may only compound the problem. It could set off a new round of procedural wrangling at the D.C. Circuit that could delay the resolution of the litigation and, with it, the start of the auction. This is all the more unfortunate because the issues here aren't critical to the incentive auction's success. And because I don't want to end this statement on a down note, I will add, with the tip of the hat to Colombo, just one more thing. 
it's still not too late to turn things around. Even after today's vote, the Commission and broadcasters can still rise above the disputes of the past, set aside any ill will that is built up, and meet each other halfway. Most importantly, if the parties were to settle the litigation, we would take a big step toward holding a timely and successful incentive auction. I hope that happens soon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a longer statement, but I'll make a couple points and move on. Substantially, there is merit to the reasoning in this declaratory ruling. In the repacking process, protecting the unpopulated areas covered by broadcast station signals make little sense. In fact, under the current procedures, a broadcast station does not receive interference protection in these unpopulated areas. Whether this entire issue is consistent with the statute, OET 69, and commission precedent is now in the hands of the D.C. Circuit. Procedurally, I have problems with the process used to generate the item. Therefore, I dissent to this particulars. During consideration of the incentive auction item earlier this year, I raised deep concerns that the speed by which we are moving left the Commission exposed to legal challenges. Now the Commission attempts to clarify a portion of the pre previous item post-haste. In doing so, it sidesteps normal Commission procedures for questionable gain. To justify this process, here are the mental hurdles that you have to overcome. The current language is not sufficiently clear. The item is truly a clarification. This is not, in fact, an untimely sua sponte order on reconsideration. Using a declaratory ruling in this manner is prudent, and modifying the reasoning of an order without public input is the proper approach. And to explain ep expediting this vote, you would have to be convinced that the Commission needs to do this now or its risk of losing in the court increases. The Commission will prevail on the merits of the other challenged parts of the incentive auction and there won't be other legal challenges to delay the incentive auction. Oh, and you have to believe that the auction's actually going to happen next summer as previously outlined. That's a heavy lift. I reiterate my desire to have the incentive auction as soon as possible, but getting it right is more important than getting it done fast. The Commission would be wise to slow down and conduct this proceeding more thoughtfully. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner? You know, only in Washington is it possible to get wound up on whether something is a modification or a clarification. Noteworthy in this discussion, this appears to be a renewal of dissent by parties that were not supportive of the approach being taken to follow the statutory requirements created by Congress for the Spectrum Incentive Auction. So let's be clear. This does not modify the treatment of coverage areas. This does explain how the report and order meets the statute. One would think that, that clearing up a misunderstanding is a good thing. That's what we're doing here. It's a common practice declaratory ruling such as this that's been used multiple times over the years. It is not, quote, highly unusual, unquote. There is going to be a spectrum auction. Congress has authorized it. We'll follow the Congress's instructions in implementing it, and we will continue to bend over backwards, to be clear and concise in explaining how the auction will function, even when it means clarifying a misunderstanding. So I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. The ayes have it. The item carries. The request for editorial privileges is granted. Now, before we move to the next item, um, we're going to do things a little different than we've done thus far uh, this morning. The order will be slightly different for the final two items. First, we'll hear, hear 
uh, presentations ad seriatim from the FCC staff, uh, followed by single statements from each commissioner regarding both items. After that, we will then proceed to separate votes on each of the two items in order. Madam Secretary, start the ball rolling, please. The next item is entitled, Amendment of Part 15 of the Commission's Rules for Unlicensed Operations in the Television Bands, Repurposed 600 MHz Band, 600 MHz Guard Bands and Duplex Gap, and Channel 37. Thank you. Julie, are you driving on this? Yep. So we, we will present two items. It's a two for one. <laughs> uh, the first item proposes changes to our existing Part 15 rules to facilitate unlicensed use in the television bands, the 600 megahertz guard bands, and channel 37 following the incentive auction. The proposals are designed to allow for robust unlicensed service and efficient spectral use of the TV bands while continuing to protect authorized users from harmful interference. The second item, which deals with wireless microphones, is joint with the wireless bureaus. Uh, I should mention that the folks we have at the table, of course, Roger Sherman, Hugh Van Tile, Paul Murray, Ira Keltz, and Jerry Matisse. And uh, I, I feel a little remiss because on all three of these items, there's a, a small cast of, uh, not thousands, but uh, a tight team of people who worked on it, and uh, they all know who they are. You're ignoring the guy next to you? <laughs> Always. Didn't he get you in this mess? <laughs> you bet. Huh? That's why. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the second item, uh, with the repacking of the television band and the repurposing of current television spectrum for wireless services, there will be less spectrum in the UHF band that's available for wireless microphone operations after the incentive auction. And so the second item proposes uh, ways that we can best address the need for different wireless microphone users over the long term while advancing the Commission's broader spectrum management goals. So the first uh, item on Part 15 will be presented by Hugh Van Tile, and when he's finished, then Paul Murray will present the wireless mic item. Great. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Driven by rapid advances in technology and entrepreneurship, the market for unlicensed wireless communication devices continues to grow at a steady pace. The Commission has fostered this development by adopting minimal technical rules that promote the development of a wide range of new wireless devices and technological advances while still protecting licensed services from harmful interference. Today, unlicensed wireless devices are part of everyone's daily life. In 2004, the Commission initiated a groundbreaking proceeding when it proposed to authorize unlicensed use of the broadcast television bands in the white spaces or unused channels which exist in almost all television markets. Some of these white spaces were already being used by wireless microphones. <coughs> Since it finalized the Part 15 white space rules in 2010, the Commission's white spaces idea has spread to other countries around the world. In the U.S. and elsewhere, unlicensed white space devices are being used to provide broadband data and other services for businesses and consumers, particularly in unserved and underserved areas. Today, the Commission takes the next step in this journey as it initiates a proceeding to lay the groundwork for white space use in the broadcast television spectrum that will be reconfigured to introduce new wireless services in the 600 megahertz ultra high frequency or UHF band following the incentive auction. The notice of proposed rulemaking would begin the process for implementing the decisions in the incentive auction report and order for unlicensed white space devices and unlicensed wireless microphones in the broadcast television bands and the repurposed 600 megahertz UHF band. Following the incentive auction, with the repacking of the television band and the repurposing of current television spectrum for wi wireless services, there will be fewer frequencies in the UHF band available for use by unlicensed white space devices and wireless microphones. The proposed changes to the Part 15 rules will allow for more robust service and efficient spectral use without increasing the risk of harmful interference to authorized users. The 600 megahertz band plan adopted in the incentive auction report and order 
which includes guard bands, a duplex gap, and the repurposed 600 megahertz band for wireless services, provides new opportunities for unlicensed white space devices, unlicensed wireless microphones, and wireless microphones licensed under Part 74. The notice discusses the potential division of the duplex gap between unlicensed devices, including both white space devices and wireless microphones, and licensed wireless microphones. The notice proposes and seeks comment on flexible Part 15 rules for fixed and personal portable white space devices in the remaining TV spectrum, guard bands, and duplex gap. The notice also proposes Part 15 rules for white space device operation on Channel 37, which is used by the Wireless Medical Telemetry Service and the Radio Astronomy Service. These proposals will help meet the growing demand for broadband services and will encourage innovation in the development of new unlicensed devices. The notice also proposes Part 15 rules for unlicensed wireless microphones in the broadcast television bands. We believe that the proposal set out in this notice will advance our dual goals of providing spectrum for unlicensed devices and protecting authorized services from harmful interference. The staff recommends adoption of the item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, Mr. Chairman morning. and Commissioners. The notice of proposed rulemaking on wireless microphones seeks comment on various steps the Commission could take to accommodate the needs of wireless microphone users over the long term. Wireless mics, as we all know, are used by businesses and consumers for a wide array of applications. They play an important role in enabling broadcasters and video programming networks to serve consumers, including in their coverage of breaking news and broadcasting of, yes, live sports events. Wireless mics serve to enhance event productions in a variety of settings, including theaters and music venues, film studios, auditoriums, commission meeting rooms, uh, houses of worship, and internet webcasts. As we know, the repurposing of broadcast television spectrum for wireless broadband services following the incentive auction will significantly alter the spectrum environment in which many wireless microphones currently operate. This notice before you lays the foundation for the Commission to take additional steps to ensure that wireless microphone users have access to devices operating in different spectrum bands that can address their needs. Most wireless microphones today operate in the television band spectrum, uh, and they will operate, though they do also operate on a limited basis in other spectrum bands. Following the incentive auction and repacking of the television bands, there will be fewer frequencies in the UHF band available for wireless microphone operations. While the Commission took several steps in the incentive auction report and order in May to provide more opportunities for wireless microphone operations in the spectrum that will remain allocated for television broadcasting, it also recognized that reduction of available UHF band spectrum will require many wireless microphone users to make adjustments over the next few years regarding the spectrum they access and the devices they use. The notice of proposed rulemaking before you seeks to address the needs of wireless microphones, both licensed users and unlicensed users, in a comprehensive fashion. The notice examines wireless microphone users' needs and different technologies that it can, can address them, including digital technologies. In spectrum bands where wireless microphones currently operate, the notice seeks comment on potential rule revisions that will accommodate better performance and increased use of wireless microphones. The notice also seeks comment on authorizing the use of wireless microphones in additional spectrum bands, so long as such use would be consistent with the Commission's overall spectrum management goals. The record established in response to this notice will provide the basis for commission, additional commission action so that wireless microphone users will continue to have access to the kinds of devices that can efficiently and effectively address their needs. The Office of Engineering and Technology and the Wireless Telecommunication Bureau request additional, excuse me, request editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to 
everybody who has uh, worked so hard uh, on, on these. Um, so we're going to have combined comments by everybody up here, and then we'll vote one at a time. Commissioner Clapper. Thank you. To casual observers, the world's first ever reverse incentive auction is only about broadcast television stations turning in their spectrum licenses so they can be resold for commercial wireless services. But a successful incentive auction will also impact the amount of spectrum available for other important communication services, such as wireless microphones, wireless medical telemetry services, and TV white spaces services. So I am glad that when we initiated the incentive auction proceeding back in 2012, which seems almost a lifetime ago, the FCC took an approach to explore how we could protect as many incumbent services as possible. These two notices continue with this commitment. Since the incentive auction order would permit TV white space devices and wireless microphones to use the duplex gaps and other guard bands, the Part 15 Notice for Pros rulemaking proposes detailed technical rules that would allow those services to operate without interfering with each other or neighboring services. Although there is a proposal to allow TV white space devices to operate in channels where they were previously excluded, the notice proposes rules that are intended to protect the incumbent services, such as medical telemetry services. There are also a number of great proposals in the companion notice of proposed rulemaking on wireless microphones. In that notice, we're developing a framework to accommodate the future and current needs of licensed and unlicensed wireless microphones. We're considering rule changes for licensed operations in all the bands where wireless microphones currently operate. We also identify new spectrum bands for wireless microphones. If you review the record in this proceeding, you will notice many presentations from broadcasters and other parties who manufacture or use wireless microphones, advocates for deployment of unlicensed TV white spaces, and users of wireless medical telemetry services. All of these presentations have a common refrain. Our technology provides critical services. The prior commission decisions have taken too much spectrum from us. And the technical arguments of our opponents are flawed, in my opinion. These notices respond to these charges in three simple but important ways. First, we agree that these technologies provide important services. Second, all parties will have to learn to live together in a spectrum-constrained environment. And third, with apologies to the lawyers on my staff and those in the room, and especially to the ones accompanying me. Now it's time to kick the lawyers out of the room and let the engineers rule. Well, okay, I know the lawyers in this room will never leave on my request, but the engineers must and will lead the way. I trust they will collaborate on tests in order for us to establish the proper technical rules that will accommodate these services, for we owe it to the consumers who use these technologies. So thank you, Hugh and Paul for your presentations. Uh, thank you, Gary, Julie, Roger, <laughs> Ira, Geraldine, and all of the other staff members who work so hard on these excellent notices. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. The only thing that you left out of your laundry list yes. of things is, and all the children are above average. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner <sorry>. Rosenworcel. <laughs> I'll listen to that on uh, Saturday, right? <laughs> We're going we're gonna to hold our next uh, commission meeting in Lake Wobegon. Yeah, anyway. All right. <laughs> in this pair of rulemakings, the commission asks a lot of questions about the 600 megahertz band. The answers we provide will have historic consequences for broadcasting, broadband, wireless microphones, medical telemetry, radio astronomy, and unlicensed spectrum. It's this last service, unlicensed spectrum, that I want to focus on right now because I think what we are doing here in the 600 megahertz band deserves some context. So I want to pause for a moment and look back to when this agency first started asking questions about unlicensed spectrum. So rewind 30 years. 
Three decades ago, the Commission was looking at what to do with a handful of underused frequencies, including portions of the 900 megahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, and 5.8 gigahertz bands. These were airwaves that had been in designated for industrial, scientific, and medical uses. But the services we thought would develop in these bands never did, because under our rules, they had to contend with interference from some widely used devices that are sort of mundane, like microwave ovens. In fact, so little was happening in this spectrum, these airwaves were known in these halls as garbage bands. The conventional wisdom was that they were just junk. They were scraps of spectrum where demand for wireless licenses would just be limited. So cue the size. But this is where the Commission did something interesting. Instead of following the traditional route and trying to provide licenses to allow single operators to control in these bands for specific purposes, the agency called for creative ideas. And once the Commission got started, the questions, they multiplied fast. Why should the Commission dictate what technologies should use these frequencies? What if we set some basic technical parameters instead? And what if we gave the public, heaven forbid, access to these airwaves? These are not easy questions to answer. And there were a lot of skeptics who preferred command and control spectrum policy. There were those for whom thinking differently about interference and optimizing the airwaves was outside of their comfort zone. But there were also innovative engineers who believed that with the right technical know-how, they could make something happen. They could make these bands work. Now, the Commission ultimately decided to side with these innovators and think differently about this patch of spectrum. As a result, Three decades ago, the Commission designated its first swath of unlicensed spectrum in these so-called garbage bands. Now, a lot happened in the interim that was important, including the development of a standard that is known as 802.11. But if you step back, and you don't even have to squint, you can clearly see how this is the spectrum where Wi-Fi was born. And today, the economic impact of unlicensed spectrum has been estimated at $140 billion annually. So in retrospect, the leap the Commission took 30 years ago paid off in a big way. In fact, it may have been the most important experiment ever in wireless communications. So back to the present. 30 years later, we are facing the same kind of question. But now for the next generation of unlicensed services. In short, can we make unlicensed spectrum, the jet fuel of innovation, work in low band spectrum? I think the answer is yes. But once again, we are going to need to think differently. And we can start by discarding the tired notion that more Wi-Fi comes only at the expense of those who want to use the airwaves for licensed services. Because good spectrum policy requires both. Because let's not forget, nearly one half of all wireless data connections in this country are now offloaded onto unlicensed spectrum. So it may not be intuitive, but it means that unlicensed spectrum is essential for managing the flow of traffic on licensed airwaves. Moreover, we need to keep an eye on what is coming next. We have new technologies like dynamic databases that can allow multiple services to coexist harmoniously. And we are seeing new services that can overcome spectral and physical challenges by moving from frequency to frequency, sometimes on spectrum that is licensed and sometimes on spectrum that is unlicensed. And while we plan for this future, we also need to recognize that key services striving for space in the 600 megahertz band, like wireless microphones, low power television, medical telemetry, and radio astronomy, they deserve attention under the law. Wireless microphones are critical for news gathering, essential for Broadway productions, and widely used in churches and schools. These microphones deserve a home. 
Low power television and translators also play an important role in communities across the country and can extend the reach of television in rural areas. Plus, lives depend on medical telemetry and radio astronomy helps us better understand the universe. That's some big stuff. So we need to pay heed. We also need to be creative because I think that our engineers, some of the same smart minds who sparked the invention of Wi-Fi 30 years ago can find ways to make all of this work. I think optimism here can pay dividends that will not only yield more services in the 600 megahertz band, but also more innovation and more Wi-Fi. So thank you to the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and to the Office of Engineering and Technology for your hard work, past, present, and future, as you wrestle with the question this pair of rulemakings pose. Thank you also to Chairman Wheeler for keeping our efforts in the 600 megahertz band barreling down the track and for making sure that Unlicensed is on board. And thank you, Commissioner Rosenworcel, for keeping us reminded of the historical precedent. Uh, history. Yesterday. History. It all, yesterday. you know, <laughs> yesterday not only informs today, but it informs tomorrow. And you right. just reminded us of that, so thank you. Mr. Pye. The Part 15 notice of proposed rulemaking reminds me of a scene, it is a movie to have reference, from the 2003 movie The Matrix Reloaded. When the Oracle appears to Neo with a question, he hesitates, wondering if she's really offering him a choice or whether the choice has already been decided. The Oracle replies, you didn't come here to make a choice, you've already made it. You're here to try to understand why you made it. So too, it appears, with today's NPRM. Why? Well, back in the May incentive auction order, the Commission decided to permit white space devices to operate in the 600 megahertz guard bands at particular power levels and bandwidths, even though we had yet to tee up the critical engineering questions that we seek comment on today. As I noted at the time, my preference would have been to seek comment in a neutral manner on whether we can permit those types of operations without causing harmful interference to licensed services before we decided to allow them. But that's now in the past, and I am pleased that we are today asking many of the right questions. As a result, I will be voting to approve in part and concur in part. The record developed in response to this notice will hopefully shed light not only on why we made the choices we did, but whether we got them right. Now, while we won't be able to answer the latter point until all of the engineering studies and comments are in, I do think there is reason for concern. The Commission's proposals carry a risk of creating impaired spectrum licenses, depressing auction revenues, and deterring auction participation. But again, since we are at the beginning of the process, I'm reserving judgment until all of the studies are in. As the record develops, I'm going to continue to apply the same principles that have governed my deliberations during the course of the incentive auction proceeding. Two of those are particularly relevant to today's NPRM. The first is respect for the laws of physics. As I've said, we must deal with the world the way it is, not as we wish it were. The laws of physics aren't liberal or conservative, Democrat or Republican. They are immutable. Or, as a young boy told Neo in the original Matrix, do not try and bend the spoon. That is impossible. Instead, only try to, re to realize the truth. Second principle, we must be faithful to the statute. As most relevant here, that means abiding by the Spectrum Act's requirement that we cannot permit any use of the guard bands that would cause harmful interference to licensed services. Now today it becomes more critical than ever that we hew to each of these pr two principles. In particular, I'm concerned that permitting white space devices to operate in the guard bands at the power levels and bandwidths proposed here might impair the adjacent license spectrum. Take the NPRM's own analysis. It shows that operating white space devices in the NPRM's proposed configurations could, in the worst case scenarios, cause harmful interference to wireless devices whenever they are within even seven meters of each other. And that would mean that white space devices could interfere with wireless handsets whenever they are in the same room. Now, the NPRM's analysis on this and other issues is only preliminary. And as it recognizes, there are a variety of factors that affect actual deployments 
that could reduce or eliminate, eliminate excuse me, the chances for interference altogether. But all of this just confirms that there's a lot of important engineering work ahead. So where does this leave us? Well, we must do more than persuade ourselves that permitting these types of operations won't cause harmful interference. Our analysis must convince potential bidders that we're not creating uh, potentially impaired spectrum licenses. For they are the ones that will be valuing the spectrum, deciding whether, th whether to participate, and ultimately putting the capital up uh, that is, will be necessary for the auction to succeed. If those potential bidders are not convinced, then it doesn't really matter what we think or say. Now, as I said when the Commission adopted the incentive auction order, I'm all in favor of making more spectrum available for unlicensed use. As has been observed, a sensible spectrum strategy includes both licensed and unlicensed spectrum. And if we can make unlicensed spectrum available here without causing harmful interference to licensed services, that is something we should seriously consider. But we have to make promises that the laws of physics and of Congress allow us to keep. Remember, the FCC's goal here is to offer generic fungible licenses. So impairing any spectrum around the guard bands will drive down the value of each and every 600 megahertz license and thus deter auction participation. That would mean less spectrum repurposed for mobile broadband and a failure to meet the Spectrum Act's revenue targets, which are critical to both public safety and deficit reduction. In the end, I hope to read some most excellent responses from our commenters, to borrow from Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, and to working with my colleagues and the Commission's talented staff on resolving these issues. Now, as for the separate wireless microphones NPRM, I will be voting to approve. I am pleased that we are considering a wide range of bands as potential long-term homes for wireless mics. And I appreciate my colleagues' willingness to incorporate my suggestions into the item, including agreeing that our goal is to issue an order before the incentive auction commences. I'm happy to support that NPRM. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> before I begin, let me acknowledge the hard work of the gentlelady from Connecticut for all that she has done to promote unlicensed spectrum use. Like Commissioner Rosenworcel, I've been and remain a strong supporter of unlicensed wireless use and the unknown possibilities that creative entrepreneurs that use it will continue to bring to the American people. These two items, which I will approve, are the direct result of Congress's work to provide for a spectrum incentive auction. That effort, of which I appreciated being a part, has generated both opportunity and concern for many in the communications sectors. The area we focus on today is the effect of the incentive auction on the spectrum that, uh, that can be used for unlicensed wireless devices and wireless microphones, which are not necessarily mutually exclusive groups. I understand the trepidation that these communities and others, including existing broadcasters, have over the reduction in spectrum allocated at 600 megahertz for commercial broadcast services. Over the last many months, I have visited and met with a wide array of interested parties to discuss and learn more about their ideas on how the Commission might address the needs and spectrum demands of unlicensed wireless device providers and wireless mic microphones, both licensed and unlicensed. From Broadway to Silicon Valley and in between, each of these meetings was highly informative and somewhat frustrating as there are no easy answers. At the heart of both of these items is science and fact, or at least it should be. I'm generally pleased by the work of the Office of Engineering and Technology to focus on the technical side of the equation of preparing these two items. While I may not agree with every outcome or proposal, the NPRMs have been drafted in a way to allow parties to provide comments, including contradictory evidence and technology studies, to frame our work going forward. I expect an ample record that includes the granular data necessary to fully inform our decision making. I'm particularly interested in hearing about tests of the technical aspects of the various ideas and proposals. Let's find out, to the best of our abilities, what works and does not work. There are definitely some areas that we need to look into pushing further, and I appreciate the chairman and commission staff for incorporating a number of my edits. For instance, I see great value in exploring opportunities for mobile unlicensed operations in Channel 37. To argue that it can't be done in a way that provides protections to incumbent users reminds me of the early debates over even allowing television white space devices. Many of us were right then, and we should allow science and fact to lead us again. On the opposite side, I have heard from many industry participants that the current proposal 
regarding wireless mics and unlicensed wireless use in the duplex gap may be unfeasible. There are strong views on this, and I'm not sure whether all information needed to make a decision is available yet. This item needs to be flushed out further, and I trust the NPRM will allow everyone to debate the merits fully. I will keep an open mind as the Commission moves ahead to fill out details of the framework and refine potential temporary decisions. To the extent we receive data that requires the Commission to reconsider or alter framework's decisions, I trust we'll be willing to do so as necessary and appropriate. In addition, I'm pleased to see today's companion notice which seeks comment on proposals for treatment of wireless microphones. This notice is comprehensive and asks many of the necessary questions. For instance, we need to encourage wireless mics to be more spectrally efficient and to move to frequencies that are not likely to be sought after for commercial purposes. In other words, any new bands that we open to wireless mics should be those that will not require that they relocate again in the future. I thank the folks at OET and WTV and Incentive Auction for their thoughtful and diligent work on these two items. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, as we have uh, heard from everybody up here, both of these items reinforce the importance of unlicensed spectrum in the wireless ecosystem. And they are also both witness to the importance of spectrum sharing in the new wireless world. Um, they are a glimpse into the future, uh, just as Commissioner Rosenworcel has given us a glimpse into the past. Um, we are going to have to deal with this issue in, on an increasingly uh, uh, expansive basis. Uh, and both of these items, importantly, move us further through the long and convoluted list of matters that must be resolved in order for there to be a successful incentive auction. So thank you to our guide through the incentive auction, uh, Gary, to Julie, Roger, Hugh, Paul, Ira, Jerry, and all of you who have put this all together. I know this has not been an easy exercise, uh, and uh, as Commissioner O'Reilly points out, we're at the beginning of the process to find out some more answers, but you've asked the right questions. So uh, with that, I'll uh, call for the vote first on the Part 15 rule. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The request for editorial privileges is granted. Now we'll go to the wireless microphones item. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The request for editorial privileges is granted. Thank you to everybody. Uh, and that brings us to the list, to the end of the list on the uh, scheduled uh, activities for the day. I would ask my colleagues, are there uh, any announcements anybody wants to make? Commissioner Clyburn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am fortunate to have four new law clerks in my office for the fall semester <coughs> and would like to introduce uh, all of them, uh, particularly three of them who are here today. And if you would stand when I call your name. Christine Sanquist, who is a third year student from the University of Virginia Law School. Benjamin Friedman, a third year student from American University Washington College of Law. And Ashley Morse, a third year student from Catholic University Columbus School of Law. A welcome. They are joined by Nellie Ann Fusner. I'm a second year student from George Washington University School of Law, who you will meet at a later date. So if you will join me in making them all welcome. Great. Thank you. Commissioner <laughs> Rosenworcel. Oh. Uh, first, I wanted to take a note uh, to mention a former colleague of mine. Anyone who serves or has served in the Office of General Counsel knows that it is a family, and it follows that whenever a member of your family passes away, you feel a personal loss. And sadly, that is the case uh, with Laurel Burgold, uh, who had an office a few doors down from mine when I was in OGC several years ago. Uh, she passed away recently, and I just wanted to mention her passing, both to thank her for her service to the commission and to express my condolences to her family um, in this trying time. Uh, I appreciate uh, John Sallet uh, letting us uh, know about that, and uh, our thoughts are with her, of course, her family, and uh, the other uh, members of OGC who are undergoing health issues. 
Uh, I'd also like to take a couple of minutes to introduce our offices for new interns who have been with us for about a month and have done great work. And if you could stand as well uh, when I announce you, Max Su is a third year law student at George Washington University where he is the senior managing editor of the Federal Communications Law Journal. Uh, over the summer, Max clerked at NAB and uh, the prior summer he worked in the U.S. Department of Commerce's Office of General Counsel. Uh, Max grew up in Pennsylvania and like all good Philadelphia sports fans is in a perpetual state of disappointment and violent frustration. I know it's been a bad weekend for his Eagles when he starts throwing batteries at, at me during the staff meetings. <laughs> Uh, Joel Thayer is our self-proclaimed senior law clerk. He's in his final year of law school at American, where he's president of AU's Communications and Media Law Society and the senior technical editor of the Intellectual Property Brief. He comes to our office from the Wireline Bureau, where he worked last summer, and he also clerked at the Telecommunications Industry Association and Competitive Carriers Association, thus making him what the chairman might call the Bo Jackson of law school trade association internships. <laughs> Uh, Joel grew up on the mean streets of Palm Springs, California, which might explain why he's always humming Sonny Bono songs when he's walking around the hallway. Uh, Erica Shannon is in her second year of law school at Georgetown, where she is a member of the Entertainment and Media Alliance. Uh, this past summer, Erica interned at Numedion, which creates virtual educational worlds for children. And she also interned at Verizon. She grew up in Japan and Germany, uh, not quite Kansas, but it'll do, and received her bachelor's degree in Japanese and sociology from Notre Dame. While in South Bend, she monitored the football team's academic schedules and helped the players develop study routines. I would note that in each of her two seasons on the job, the Fighting Irish went eight and five. The season after she left South Bend, the team went 12 and one and went to the national championship game. Coincidence? I don't know. And uh, finally, David Shim is in his second year of law school at George Washington. Uh, prior to law school, David worked as an IT support manager at EMC Corporation and spent this past summer at Cisco. Uh, David's originally from South Korea, but grew up in Boston. And in high school, he was an all-state soccer player. It's a shame he wasn't around during this uh, past summer as World Cup to share his insights. Uh, like most New Englanders, David is a diehard Red Sox fan, and notwithstanding all the press coverage you might have seen over the past week, he has asked me personally to share this message with all of you. Quote, no more Garcia Pera was still better than Derek Jeter at his best, period. <laughs> if any New Yorkers would like to speak with him, he will have a press availability after the chairman's press conference is over. Uh, we are glad that Max, Joel, Erica, and David have joined us uh, for the semester, and I thank them in advance for all the great work they're going to do. I have uh, one final announcement. Uh, as everyone knows, the open internet proceeding has generated a great deal of public interest. Uh, some have said that the FCC needs to get outside of the beltway and listen to those who would be affected by the commission's rules. I agree with that sentiment. And so this morning, I would like to announce that I will be holding a forum on internet regulation on October 21st in College Station, Texas. Uh, this field hearing will examine the Commission's open internet proceeding from a variety of perspectives. I'm honored that the event will be hosted by Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service. Uh, from his days as a Navy pilot during World War II to his time in the White House, President George H.W. Bush exemplified professionalism, principle, and civility in public service. I can think of no better place than the Bush School to have a substantive discussion about one of the most important public policy issues facing our country. Uh, my office will be announcing additional information about this event, including a list of panelists in the coming days. I hope that my colleagues will join me in the Lone Star State for this important forum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and thank you for uh, bringing up uh, Laurel and reminding us uh, of her service. She was a fabulous litigator here, um, devoted 30 years of her life to the success of this agency. and. Uh, our hearts go out to, to her family. Commissioner O'Reilly? Um, I'm uh, also excited to uh, welcome a few new interns into our office, uh, Stephen Jakura. Stephen is not here today. Um, uh, he uh, needs no other qualification than to say that he is from the Ohio State University. <laughs> where he is uh, finishing his last year of undergrad and uh, participating in a program where um, they get uh, experience uh, in Washington for a semester, uh, uh, attend some classes here, and, um, and get credit uh, for that. We also have uh, two legal interns, uh, Fanilla Chang. Fanilla, stand up here. Fanilla is with Georgetown Law. 
She's just finished an internship at the uh, Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division, and she's going to be working with us on Media Bureau issues. So, Fenella, we're glad that you're here. And she'll be joined with, by Leah Rabkin. Leah, also from Georgetown Law. Previously, Leah had interned at uh, NBC Universal, Comcast NBC Universal, and she's also worked for Congressman Doris Matsui. So we're glad that both Leah and Fenella are with us. I would also like to uh, recognize and congratulate some very special award winners uh, at the agency. The, the Excellence in Economic Analysis and Excellence in Engineering Analysis Awards recognize commission staff for outstanding analytical or technical contributions to the FCC and the American people. The 2014 Economics Award will be split between two members of the Wireline Competition Bureau, Octavia Carre and Jay Schwartz. So if they can stand up and be recognized. Octavia and, and Jay won for their paper, The Willingness to Pay for Broadband Non-Adopters in the U.S. Estimates from a Multi-State Survey. Their paper concludes that up to 10 million households in the U.S. that have access to broadband may be willing to subscribe if a discount is offered. And it also concludes that a 15% reduction in price would lead to a 9% increase in adoption. This is the 13th year uh, for this uh, uh, EEA uh, program, and we expect many more worthy awardees uh, in the future. Congratulations to, to both of you. The uh, 2014 Engineering Award goes to Janet Young. Janet, there she is, okay, <laughs> Janet. Janet is an engineer in the Broadband Division of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. She was the only FCC member of the first technical panel created under the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012. She provided engineering analysis that shortened the transition timelines of federal incumbents that are relocating or implementing sharing arrangements with commercial licensees in two frequency bands that are part of the AWS 3 Spectrum Auction. A incredibly important and unbelievably challenging activity. Um, and that, the work that she did will allow us to, uh, to move rapidly to an auction um, in six weeks, November 14th, when the uh, AWS 3 auction. So Janet, thank you for everything that, that you have done. <laughs> now, Octavian, uh, Jay, and Janet, after I bang the gavel and we finish up here, would you three please come up here and let's get a picture with the three of you and uh, the five of us. Um, are there any things, other things to bring? That uh, being the case, we uh, look forward to seeing you at the October meeting, which will be on October 17th, and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>
we're moving full steam ahead on implementing the first in the world incentive auction. At the end of the day, nothing is more critical to the auction's success than broadcaster participation. So that's why, in addition to making the policy decisions and developing the details of the auction design, educating broadcasters about the incentive auction is one of our biggest priorities. Tomorrow, we will begin sending to every eligible broadcaster an information package, voila, that um, it was prepared for the FCC by the respected investment banking firm of Greenhill Associates. It will describe in detail the economic potential of the auction. This is an economic decision that broadcasters have to make. Let's approach this like a traditional economic transaction involving the expertise of investment bankers. Gary Epstein, Howard Simons, and Bill Lake will be holding a press call tomorrow to walk you through this Green Hill information package. I've described the participation in the reverse auction as being a virtually risk-free and unique opportunity for broadcasters. With this information package, broadcasters won't have to take my word for it. They'll see that it is a unique, risk-free opportunity. And armed with this information, it's my hope and my expectation that broadcasters will give participating in the incentive auction very careful consideration. Of course, the FCC is not just busy pioneering new policies. We're eliminating and modernizing outdated ones, such as what you saw today with the Part 25 rules for satellites. And there is no better example of an FCC rule that has outlived its usefulness than our sports blackout rule. Now, I know that some of you who watched last night's Washington-New York Giants game might have wished it was blacked out. But, all kidding aside, the FCC's blackout rule was enacted in 1975 when the NFL's main source of revenue was gate receipts and most games didn't sell out. Today, the NFL is an entertainment powerhouse, generating nearly 10 billion dollars a year, mostly from TV revenue. Clearly, the NFL no longer needs the government's help to remain viable. And we at the FCC will not be complicit in preventing sports fans from watching their favorite teams on television. Today, the FCC eliminated the sports blackout rule. And I hope, and this is something that the sports teams themselves control, I hope this leads to the elimination of sports blackouts altogether. With that, I look forward to your questions. Paul. Paul Kirby with TR Daily. Your recent comments at CTIA um, were interpreted by some that you feel that wireless providers should be treated the same as wireline when you all uh, come up with some rules in the open internet proceeding. Is that a fair characterization of, of your feelings? Paul, I think I'll stand on what I said there. Uh, you know, um, we will be dealing with that when we bring out the, uh, the item. Gotham? Uh, Chairman, you recently commented in an interview that you thought the name of the Washington Redskins was offensive and derogatory and perhaps no longer relevant. Um, of course, there are other NFL and sports teams with Native American names, such as the Kansas City Chiefs, the Atlanta Braves. Do you find the Redskins name uniquely offensive, or do you think that some of these other names are also offensive and derogatory? I was asked specifically about the name of the Washington football team. And I believe in my response, I said, you know, things change over time. I'm a history buff. You know, 
there are a lot of names and descriptions that were used over time that are inappropriate today. And I think the name that is attributed to the Washington Football Club is one of those. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom Risen, U.S. News and World Report. I'd like to ask about uh, possible use of Title II for net neutrality. Uh, there's a section in uh, Title II on uh, obscenity and uh, harassing communications. If you decide to apply Title II to Internet providers for the purpose of net neutrality, are there sec provisions in there that could potentially give this or future um, commissions authority to regulate content online, or would the commission uh, pick and choose when applying certain provisions to uh, net neutrality? So let me be sure I understand. So there is a double hypothetical with a full gainer uh, in that question. I'd like, um, I'd like to know if there's anything the, that could potentially I, get authority. I, I, I think so. This is, you know, I'm not going to respond to hypotheticals. I have said Title II is on the table, period. Hi, Chairman. Uh, Brendan Sasso with National Journal. Uh, so uh, there is a proposal going around, we gather, about uh, reclassifying some online video services uh, as cable providers. I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that, uh, what your thought process is on coming up with that proposal and when it might get a vote. I think that a proposal going around is probably a bit of an overstatement, Brendan. <laughs> um, I mean, you guys are good. Um, and somebody found out that it was an idea that was being kicked around rather than going around, and that's where it stands. I, I had said previously in an interview when somebody asked me about it that I'm not ready to plant the flag, and I stick with that statement. Brian? Hi, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, in an interview on C-SPAN, FTC Commissioner Olhausen um, said that she would be concerned if the, FT, if the FCC were to reclassify broadband under Title II, saying that um, uh, it would keep the FTC from being able to use its Section 5 authority to bring enforcement actions against misbehaving broadband providers. Uh, are, is the commissioner's concerns justified? Wow. Um, Brian. I've got a, we have a great relationship with the FTC. Edith Ramirez, Chairman Ramirez and I uh, frequently uh, are in communication with each other on, on common issues and we realize that we have shared responsibilities. We are going to, uh, we have shared responsibilities in some areas. Um, we are going to, um, to be proceeding on the open internet um, uh, matter on, a, on the basis of what is the best way for us to assure the American people that there is an open and vibrant internet? That'll be the basis on which we'll make the decision. Hi, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to clarify, are you exploring a compromise on net neutrality? And if so, what sort of compromise is under consideration? Maybe you noticed there were 3.7 million different ideas that came in <laughs> yeah, on the open internet. You know, we're looking at a lot of things that were uh, suggested uh, in the open uh, internet uh, comments. Uh, Julie Veach put out a blog the other day in which she identified uh, a bunch of the things that are of interest that we've been looking at that were, that were, uh, that were uh, submitted during the process. That's where we are. But could that potentially include a compromise proposal between Title II and, and Section 706? I think I just answered the question. <laughs> okay. Kamala? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Kamala Lane, Communications Daily. Uh, Chairman, um, just going back to, you know, any item that may be being kicked around regarding um, expanding obligations of MVPDs to, to over-the-top video, um, can you uh, disclose what um, prompted that? Wow, you know, so we, we consider a whole heck of a lot of ideas floating around here. You want to make sure that you're always keeping up with technology. You want to make sure you're always keeping up with innovations um, in the marketplace. Um, this falls into that kind of category. Elena? Hi, Chairman. Um, several weeks ago, uh, you collected data from the ISPs on peering as well as from wireless carriers on data throttling. Is there any update you can give us on the review process that's going on, um, what you're learning, or when we're going to find out what 
what your thought process on that is. I wish I could say something other than no. Uh, they, uh, well, I've got no information to share with you at that point, this point in time. Brooks. Why does or does not the FCC have the authority to sanction broadcasters for using the nickname for the Washington football team? So first of all, thank you for the way you put that question. Um, the, uh, that's a matter that, as you know, we've now been petitioned on. We will be looking at that petition. We will be dealing with that issue on the merits and we'll be responding accordingly. Todd. Hi, Mr. Chairman. Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. What is your reaction to Comcast's response filing last week in the merger docket to the tone and to what they said? Um, I think that we have in that docket um, lots of people expressing lots of strongly held positions, and they certainly fit in that category. Did Comcast sound like a bully to you? you know, I think everybody gets to express their position strongly. You know, I have uh, I've been noted myself to once in a while. Uh, engage in, uh, in a little hyperbole. So, uh, you know, I think that they've, uh, this is an pr ongoing process. Thank Julie, you, everyone. Oh, Julie, we get, did you have a question? Oh, Julie, oh, yeah. and standing in the back, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you talked about how you hope this will be the beginning of the end of sports blackouts at large. Now, there's a bill on Capitol Hill, uh, there may not be floor, that provides for mm -hmm. that to happen. You know, um, Far be it from me to tell Congress what to do. Uh, you know, I think they'll make their decision and their process. My job, our job, the five of us sitting here, is to make decisions based on what our authority is, and that's what we did today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Um, are there questions for the bureaus, bureaus today? Okay. Um, all right. So the first sports blackout. Any questions on sports blackout? Okay. So that would be the media bureau, please. Okay. Well then, well then we'll do it. All right. Today, when is it effective? When when will it no longer when will we no longer have a federal rule enforcing sports blackouts? Thirty days after the decision is reported in the Federal Register. Okay, but how long does that take to get into the register? It can take a couple of weeks. Okay. So, for most of this football season, we'll have the federal rule. It just occurred to me. For thirty days plus a couple of weeks. Yes. Thank you. So what, I'm just kind of curious, what, what sort of happens to the uh, regulation itself? Does it just get a bright red line or wrapped through it, or are there other things you have to unpack to uh, uh, eliminate the rule? The order repeals the rules, and they'll be taken out of the CFR, so they will just, the rules will no longer be there. They just disappear in a few months? Yep. That's it. Anything else on sports blackout? Okay, Thanks. so for satellite item. Okay, declaratory ruling. That would be easy. Um, all right, part 15. Going once. Wireless mics. That's it. <laughs> going, going, going. Thank you, everybody. You got the easy job, right? <laughs>